is in need of prayer. You see, the sad part about it is we have a generation of people that are following my generation and my children's generation. They're getting further and further away from God. And why is that? Because the institutions of learning that were actually instituted by the church no longer is run by the church. Come on, somebody. The hospitals that we go to sometimes were founded and instituted by the church, but are no longer run by the church. You know, the church needs to be the focal point of every community. And it just doesn't seem to be that way anymore because people are looking to government more than they're looking to the church. Can I, can I get an amen? amen? Hallelujah. I'm here to tell you tonight that we are the end time church. If you haven't figured that out, figure it out. Because we are the end time church and because we're the end time church, I said that twice now to emphasize, we need to be the ones of the watchmen on the wall. You ever heard of that? That's some old time preaching there. Watchmen on the wall. In other words, they were appointed to look over things. To make sure that when the enemy or something that was arrived was coming their way, that they would sound a warning. Yes. Tonight I'm sounding a warning. Amen. That there needs to be a reformation, not only in the church, but in your life. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Ezekiel, the 22nd chapter in verse 30 is where we're going to start tonight. And I entitled this message, Standing in the gap. Standing in the gap. And you say, well, that don't make much sense. Well, it will, hopefully, by the time I get done. Can we stand for the reading of God's Word tonight? Thank you, Jesus. Yes, say that again. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, amen. amen. Thank you. Uh -huh. Praise God. Y'all there? Yes, All right, we're going to read. And the Bible says, And I sought for a man. God was seeking for a man. Yes. He said, And among them, that should make up the hedge. Oh, oh man, right there. We could, we could stop right there and preach. Yeah. And stand in the gap before me and the land that I should not destroy it. I'm going to read that again. That I should not destroy it. But I found none. You may be seated. Father, we thank You, Lord, for the Word. We thank You, God, for Your inspiration. We thank you, God, for your love and dedication toward a people that sometimes God doesn't deserve it. And Father, we praise you and thank you tonight that, God, you are going to bring us to a place of decision. And Father, your word should always bring us to a place of decision. And Father, help us. Through prayer and supplication, make the right decision. Amen. And all would say, Amen. 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 You know, when you go into the Old Testament prophets, they were not always received well. Anywhere they want, or they went. They wanted the people to like them. That's like every human being. We want people to like us. But sometimes, the message that God has laid on our heart isn't always a popular message. That's true. Think about that for just a moment. Sometimes the message that God lays on our hearts is not always popular. There was a placard that I had read oh, several years ago Hopefully I can quote it correctly. It said, what is popular isn't always right. And what is right isn't always popular. The Word of God has been lampooned, ridiculed, burned, 
stepped on, stomped on, and rejected. But it is still alive and well. Yes, it is. Amen. It has stood the test of time. It has stood the test of time through every despot, every monarch, every evil king, every providence that tried to annihilate it, the Adolf Hitlers, the Paul Potts, all of these people have come against the word of Almighty God. Communism hates the gospel. Folks, I'm here to tell you, if you haven't looked around, socialism mm -hmm. is right at our back door. Right. Socialism is a kissing cousin to communism. Yes. That's right. <clears throat> I had someone come up to me and say one time, well, you know, socialism works. Socialism is in the Bible in Acts chapter 3. I said that was temporary, son. Uh -huh. Our dependency should be on God and our source should be Him. That's right. That's right. Amen. All the time. Yes. And we have a responsibility to not only the church, but we have a responsibility to the world out there to herald righteousness yes. Yes. in the midst of evil Amen. and just trying to raise its ugly head. Church, we need to be the one with the answer. Yes. Go ahead. And we have the answer, and His name is Jesus Christ. We are the entity, if you will, the body that holds back all the evil, because once the trumpet sounds, once the church is removed, to coin a phrase, all hell will break loose. And what I mean by that is, all the rudiments of hell. The darkness. The gnashing of teeth. The pain. The molestation of demons. None of this is popular. No one likes to hear this. But I'm here to tell you that that is happening right now. I was joking in Sunday school this morning and I said, you know, when you're possessed, you better be possessed of the Holy Ghost if you're possessed of anything. Yeah. But there's a lot of people today that are possessed of demons. Right. There's a lot of people that are possessed with an Antichrist spirit. Come on now. Yes. We're seeing the Antichrist spirit rearing its ugly head in our institutions of higher learning. Because where an antichrist spirit is, communism follows. Because where there is Christ, the Bible says there is liberty. Amen. Our founding fathers knew that as they instituted the Word of God into our sacred documents called the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and all of these things, it said we had inalienable rights given to us by our Creator. Yeah. Our Creator gives us the power yes. to bring liberty to the captive. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. Deliverance to those that are bound. Yes. And that's why we have to stand in the gap for those that cannot help themselves. They find themselves in situations they don't know the answer. Yes. Now it says here in that verse of Scripture, and stand in the gap. Gap in the Greek is the word gaparetes. It means a break or a breach or a breaking forth, a gap. You see, we're seeing a gap between a generation that knew God and knows God to a generation that rejects God. How can you identify that generation? Because the genera this, this generation is rejecting the very truths of God. Right. What do I mean? Put your seatbelts on. Confusion. Those that do not know God or His Holy Spirit will walk around in confusion. Uh -huh. Has anybody noticed confusion in society lately? Yes. First, it's the gender confused. 
Listen, it's not too confusing. Amen. There's either a stem on the apple or there's not. God is not confused. When He makes a male, He means for a male to be a male. When He makes a female, He means for the female to be a female. There's not a confusion here. Listen, we have got here to this point based on that idea. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. We see now in the news that the LGBTQ, X, Y, and Z groups want to have all of our children put on blockers. <clears throat> what do I mean by that? Blockers to block the, the development of a body. In other words, you know, we go through what they call, and somebody help me on this, when we start going through puberty, our bodies begin to change and morph into what God created us to be. They say they want those particular stages blocked by chemical induction. Hello, somebody. As a preacher of the gospel, I have to say, watch out, folks. You see, there's no problem with God, what God created. The problem is, is when the creation itself thinks it's smarter than the Creator. You see, we've got genetic manipulation. You start playing God when you get into that field. We've got a lot of people now that are trying to justify Oh, Lord, I don't want to preach this tonight. They want to justify mankind's idea of who man is supposed to be. Listen, God wasn't confused when He made man. Never was. And He certainly was not confused when He caused the sleep to come over Adam. And He took that rib and He made a help me for him. And then he told them to procreate. In other words, to repopulate the earth. And we've been doing that since that day. And it's worked. You see, America is losing her way. We are more prone to listen to what society wants than what the Word of God proclaims. You see, society is getting away from a godly point of view to a secular, humanistic point of view. We're in trouble when the church begins to put more stock into humanistic psychology than in the Word of Almighty God that has the cure to every proclivity and every problem known to man. Amen, amen. There is a break of righteousness in our society. And what's even worse, I see people's conscience beginning to be seared. The Bible says that when our consciousness is seared, then we become reprobate. In other words, there's no consciousness of sin anymore. See, back in the 1950s, I began to research and see a shift. Society no longer acts like the days of Mayberry. Where there was an innocence in society. Yeah, there was things going on. There was things happening that weren't right. But the moral compass was still church and God and righteousness and what was right. Now, what is right is wrong in the eyes of this newer generation coming up because they don't want to be told no. You see, another thing, the Bible says you don't work, you don't eat. But you see, communism and socialism says we're going to hand you everything you need and it's going to be free. Free ain't free. 
It costs somebody. And I don't mean to get political and I don't mean to talk about things that stir you or anger you, but somebody's got to point it out. You see, the watchman on the wall was appointed to watch out for certain things that would destroy the society, would change the culture. Here's another thing that's coming our way. It's called cancel culture. We want to cancel out Jesus in every form of our government, in our society. We want to remove the monuments that have anything to do with Jesus Christ. We want to remove monuments that will remind the people of we the people in order to form a more perfect union. See, one of the things that I used to know was going to school in the morning, getting in the classroom, putting my hand over my heart and saying the Pledge of Allegiance. Where's the patriotism, folks? Where is the patriotism? A lot of people don't realize that the national anthem has now had a stigma to it where we shouldn't sing it at sporting events. Listen, we're one nation under God. We've always been one nation under God. Indivisible with liberty and justice for all. You see, when I was a little kid, I put my hand over my heart and I would recite that with joy. I felt like I was a part of something that was bigger than me. Yeah. Right. Bigger than myself. And even though I wasn't living for God, there was still something inside of me that stirred every time I said, under God. Yeah. Yes. There was a power. There was a sense of righteousness. There was a sense of moral yes. direction. Amen. For lack of a better word. And now we're seeing the church begin to drift away from the standards. From the Word. This is why I see a church that's beginning not to pray. Not spend time with the God that we say we serve. And oftentimes we get in and we begin to sing praises to a God that we don't even talk to. We lift our hands up to a God that we don't even communicate with. We need to be that people that the Word declares that we are. We need to be that people that's willing to get in the position of praying and seeking His face in a repentant attitude. You see, the church has went to seeking His hand instead of His face. We want to see what we can get from God. Come on, somebody. Instead of getting with God. We need to be the people that pray. In other words, we need to be the prayers prayers of intercession. We need to be the prayers of intercession. Why? Because we are essential in a world that has forgotten about Him day in and day out. They push Him aside. And as they push Him aside, the sin comes in. The sin comes in. It becomes the order of the day. It becomes something that we're getting used to. I don't want to get used to sin. God saved me from sin. I got as far away from sin as I could get away from it. But every day I turn on my television set. And I begin to see things on my TV program. That I shouldn't be seeing. That I shouldn't be hearing. Oh, I know, I sound like a 1950s preacher right now. But what I'm telling you is, the Bible told us in the book of Daniel 
that those things that you thought was ungodly that shouldn't be in your home will be piped right into your home if you're not careful. When sin becomes the order of the day, friends, the church is at next to be attacked. You see, at the time of the prophet Ezekiel, all of Israel had sinned. The prophets, the priests, the princes, the common people, they were all guilty of sin. God said, before my judgment falls, I will sin, I will search, I will try to find a man to stand in the gap Honey, I'm here to tell you that we are the entity that needs to stand in the gap. Church, we are the people that need to pray for the ungodly. We need to pray for the backslidden. We need to pray for the religious people. And those that just play church. To take the spiritual blinders off of their eyes and let them realize we don't have much time left. I said, Lord, every time I preach anymore, it seems like I'm, I, I, I'm a doomsday preacher. Honey, we are coming to the end of this age. And we have a job to do. Judgment is just on the precipice. You can see it coming. God said, before my judgment falls, or comes upon the nation of Israel, as he told Ezekiel, I'm looking for a man. I'm looking for that certain someone that will sanctify themselves. In other words, pull themselves away from the dross and the uck and the muck and the mire, from the sewage. He asked Ezekiel, he said, Are you that man? Ask yourself tonight, are you that man, are you that woman that God has called to be a light in a land of darkness? Uh, amen. I don't know if you've ever been in a candlelight service or not, but I was in one last year in this church. Me and my wife was. And we weren't even attending this church at that time. Our church wasn't having church at night. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make some preachers mad. If you're not having church on Sunday night, what are you doing? Right. Come on, preach that. Amen. They're going to kick us off YouTube. I just feel it. But it's okay. The Bible said He found none. We're talking about the land of Israel. We're talking about Jehovah. We're talking about His chosen people. And He couldn't find one person to stand in the gap for that nation. Right. Honey, I'm here to tell you that if America's not careful, we will be just like Israel. Yes. But he found none, the Scripture said. You see, God has been merciful. He has been gracious to our country. He has put a hedge of protection over America for many years. We have been the superpower over the globe. Our currency has ran the world. But I'm here to tell you that when the sin and the stench of sin begins to raise up into the heavens and gets into the nostrils of God and there's a stench in His nostrils, He has got to do something about it. God has placed His head's protection over His children. Those that are truly in covenant with Him will have His protection. The Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust alike. But God's people will be sustained through those periods of time. How do I know that's true? I don't know. Ask Noah. Sin all around him. All around him. And God said, you know what? You're righteous. And because you're righteous and you're crying out for 120 years, he cried out. 
as he built that boat. And they all looked at him like he was stark raving crazy. You've heard that story told, 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 inside out and all about it. You've heard it told time and time again. But there is an implication of that story that we need not ever forget. He was diligent in times where it didn't really look like he needed to be. Right now, folks, everything's going fine. Looks like the church is okay. But I'm here to tell you that whoever is president next yeah. is coming after the church. Yeah. And I'm going to get political. All right. yeah. The Democratic Party is not the church's friend. That's right. The last good Democrat died in a limousine in Texas. What I am seeing now is a Democratic Party that has adopted socialism and underlying communism in its platform. They wanted to kick God out of their terminology four years ago. I'm here to tell you, saints of God, that if you are associated with that party, you better start running to the hills. And I'm not saying every one of you sign your card up and say, oh, I'm a Republican now. I mean, I'm an independent. But first and foremost, I'm a Christian. And I vote my moral compass. <coughs> Getting back to my sermon. <laughs> you see... Sin in the life of a believer makes a gap in the hedge of protection that surrounds him or her. I'm going to read that one again. Sin in the life of a believer makes a gap in the hedge of protection that surrounds him or her. If we say we're in covenant with God, then we better continue to stay in covenant with God. In other words, when we said yes to Jesus, we said yes to everything that's in this covenant. The Bible says it's yes and amen for them that believe. That our actions better reflect our confession. There's so many professors out there. Oh yeah, I know God, I know God. The problem is you don't know God. There's a difference between knowing about something and actually knowing. right. This gap, when this gap appears in your life, let me tell you what happens. When the gap appears, troubles are free to enter your life. Oh, and here I go again. The most neediest people in the church, the ones that burn pastors out, are the ones that continue to run back to the sin that they say they left at the altar. They have violated the covenant. And they expect God to honor that covenant when they themselves have violated it and caused a gap in the protection that's a part of the covenant. When the troubles come in, the blessings flee. When a nation sins, the principle is the same. Let's go to a familiar verse of Scripture, shall we? Second Chronicles 7.14. Let's break that one down. First of all, who's he talking to? If my people... If my people, which are called by my name, in other words, if you're a part of my covenant, and you confess me as your Lord, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. All He wants us to do is to lay our pride aside and say, God, You are Lord in my life. And God, if I have messed up, if I have caused there to be a gap, God, I am laying it down at this altar. And God, I ask for Your blood to cover me again. I repent before You. 
And I ask you, God, to restore me, redeem me, regenerate me, and place that hedge about me. What else does it say? And turn from their... That's pretty self-explanatory. Well, wait a minute. If we're God's people, if we're called by His name, and if we should humble ourselves and pray and seek His faith with repentance, then we should not have any wicked ways in us. We should, what does that mean? It means the practice of sin. That's what it means. A continual practice of sin. And then, and then I will hear from heaven. <laughs> and I will, not maybe if, but I will forgive their sin. And I will heal their land. Folks, I'm here to tell you, it's not too late for America. It's not too late for me or you. Hallelujah. If we will humble ourselves and turn from our wicked ways. In other words, practice, don't practice, don't practice sin. Then He will hear from heaven and He'll forgive our sin. The sins of a nation. And America's not innocent by any means. We have done some heinous things over the years as a nation. But what has the church done about that? We should do what he says. We should humble ourselves. And pray. And seek His face with repentance. And He'll heal our land. He'll forgive our sins. Now, the sins of a nation, I'll say it again, will create a gap in the hedge of protection that surrounds its people. And through the gap, listen to this one. And through the gap that the nation and the people of that nation have caused, God will enter in and destroy that nation. Yeah. Why? Because He has to judge sin. Yes. You see, God is a God of love. I've heard that preach and preach and preach. Yes, He is a God of love. He is a God of a God paid God kind of love. A love that is so deep that our minds cannot even comprehend the depth of that love. But yet He is a God of justification. He is a God of justice. Yes. Yeah. Amen. And He has to judge sin. Because He is a righteous God. He has to do this. He has no choice. Because if He doesn't, then He'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. He'll have to apologize to the people that the flood came and destroyed at the time of Noah. He'll have to apologize. But God's not going to have to apologize. Because God is a just God. God's a sovereign God. He's a merciful God. And because He has no choice but to judge sin, what does He do out of His mercy? He tries to find the person to proclaim righteousness to a people, to get them to turn from their wicked ways. First, He tries to find someone to intercede for them. There's been many people over the years that have tried to minister over the United States of America and minister to her presidents. One of them was Billy Graham. Franklin Graham took up the mantle of his father. But in a certain administration, he was barred from the White House. Folks, I'm here to tell you, that wasn't a good idea. And that certain administration also treated 
the Israel Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu with total disrespect. Come on, preacher. Two of the things that God said, don't do. What am I talking about? Those that bless Israel shall be blessed. Those that curse Israel shall be cursed. We know that God is this. He's not willing that anyone should perish. But that all should come to what? Repentance. 2 Peter 3.9 says this. God has not left us ignorant. He has given us His Word. It says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise that some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us Word. In other words, His grace is sufficient in all things, but He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Listen, this is a conditional word. If you want forgiven, He'll forgive you. But you've got to show Him that you want the forgiveness. God will accept one man who will stand in the gap for a sinful people. Ask yourself, are you willing to pay that price? Come on, church. Are we willing to pay the price? I'm not saying it just has to be you to be the lone duck, but I'm telling you that if we get together as a church and we literally utilize our Tuesday morning prayer meeting we can begin to pray and turn some things around. I'm here to tell you that when you communicate with God and we begin to repent on behalf of our nation, God will hear those prayers. He will hear them. Hmm. And when He hears them, He'll be well pleased. He said, well, preacher, I wasn't around when that happened. Doesn't matter. Who do you represent? Who do you serve? Listen. Some of you say, well, I wasn't around when slavery took place. I shouldn't have to pay reparations. No, you shouldn't. But we should pray over that dark stain over our nation. So many things that our nation has been guilty of. And we may not have been there. That may not have been our generation. But I'm here to tell you that we represent a God that covered those generations. There was a hedge there. And He always cried out to that people, Repent. 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 I never knew what that word was. I said, told, somebody told me, Repent. I said, what is that? And then I found out what it was. And I found out that repentance is not a bad thing. In other words, getting rid of the sin in my life. And that God said He'll turn you around and He'll hoist you up into a high position. Thank you, Jesus. Now, He's going to look for that person. And He has chosen some people over the, over the, over the generation. One example is Abraham. He was willing to stand in the gap for Sodom. Uh -huh. Woo, what a place. Yeah. In Genesis uh, in, in chapter 18, uh, verses 23 through 33, it says, And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? <laughs> Listen, there are holy people in America. 89.9% yeah. right. of America does have holy, righteous, evangelical people in it. Now, pre-adventure there be 50 righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy not spare the place of the 50 righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from thee. Lord, you wouldn't do that, he says. Verse 28. Let's see, 29. Let's go to the next one. Not the judge of all that earth do right. And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within this city, then I will spare all the place of their stakes. 
And Abraham answered and said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. In other words, I'm really nobody, but God, I'm still going to approach you, and I'm still going to petition for the people that are doing wrong. But I am going to tell you that there are righteous in that place. And would you destroy the righteous over what the wicked are doing? Now, you're all right. And then it says, Preadventure there shall lack five of the fifty righteous. Wilt thou destroy all the city for lack of five? And he said, If I find there forty and five, I will not destroy it. And he spake again and yet again. He said, Preadventure there shall be forty found there. And he said, I will do it not for forty's sake. And he said unto them, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Preadventure thee shall thirty be found there. He said, I will do not, I won't do it. If I find 30 there, and he said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. You see what he's doing? He is trying to make a deal with God to save a city. What should we be doing? We should be pleading. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, let the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet this, this once. Preadventure ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. And the Lord and went his way. As soon as he left, communing with Abraham, and Abraham returned unto his place. That's yes, it is. Yeah. He pleaded for a place that was so wicked. And so vile that they stormed the door of Lot's house when the angels were there and said, We want those men. They were so bold in their sin, and yet the righteous held their tongue. You see, unrighteousness prevails when righteous people say nothing. Church, we have said nothing for too long. We need to be those people that are violent with their faith. When I have people getting up on their so-called soapboxes and telling me I have to accept perversion as the order of the day. I said, no, -uh. no, not me. Because I serve a God of righteousness. I serve a God of holiness. And this nation was based on holiness and founded on those principles. And I will not stand for unrighteousness, but I will give my life for righteousness. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. See, surely God does not ask a lot by asking us to stand in the gap for a world that has forgotten Him days on end. Think about it. We as Christians should pray for others as well as ourselves. But most of the time our prayers are more concerned about what I want. Yes. You know it's true. Come on, folks. Yes. It's all about us. When it should be about them. Amen. Listen, there's times where, yes, I do pray for my family. And yes, I do pray for the things... But when my, those prayers outnumber the other prayers, what are we really praying for? We need to humble ourselves and pray for others. You know, we can repent of our sins with His help. Reform our own lives. And then try to influence others to do likewise. But when we are praying only for material satisfaction, and we're not praying for righteousness. Uh -huh. There's a problem. Number two. Psalms 106 verse 23. Therefore he said that he would destroy them had not Moses his chosen stood before him in the breach. Yeah. To turn away his wrath lest he should destroy them. Listen. God had shown up many times for the Israelites. 
He parted the Red Sea. He produced quail for them. Water came out of the rock. He promised them the promised land. And yet we still had a people that grumbled and complained and bawled about everything that God had done for them. And yet they were still walking around years later in the same clothes that did not become threadbare. And get this. Have you ever thought about this? The shoes grew with their feet. And the clothes grew with their arms and their legs and their waists. Come on somebody. God was performing miracles for them day in and day out. And yet they had the audacity to continue to bellyache in the face of God. Oh, God help us. God help us. Listen, we need to recognize the love and the blessings of God in our life. And that should be enough to get us primed up and pumped up to begin to pray for those that know nothing about this glorious gospel that we live every day of our lives. Amen. When I sit down to do my bills, there's no way there's enough money to pay everything. But there is. There is. I shouldn't be living in the house I'm living. I shouldn't be driving the truck I'm driving. But God. <laughs> but God. But God. Thank you, Jesus. You see, Moses stood in the gap to turn away the wrath. To turn away God's wrath from that people. That would have been deserving of death. Mmm. But what happened? Those people finally got to Moses. Don't tap the rock twice, Moses. <sighs> Lord, you don't know what kind of people I'm dealing with. Yes, he does. Yeah. Yeah. And what did he do? Yeah, whack! And then he whacked it again. Yeah. And God said, well, I have to show you that I am a just God. You will not enter in to the promised land. We have to be careful if we are to be that people to stand in the gap. We must understand that we are not above God's judgment. Alright. Last and final. Got ten minutes to do it. Alright. The greatest example of all. Some of you are following me. And you know it. Jesus. The great intercessor. Stood in the gap for every single one of us in generations that he did not even see. But he did it. He did it. He did it. As he hung on the cross, he was praying. He went through the beatings, went through the ridicule, went through the rejection. Went through them pulling his beard out and beating him so bad he looked like ground hamburger standing before them. In Luke 23, 34, he said, then said Jesus after all of that, Father, strike him dead. No, he didn't say that, did he? He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and they cast lot. And here he was praying for them and they were gambling for his clothes. Yes. In conclusion, someone say amen. He's just amen. about done. <laughs> In conclusion, we now know that intercession is both needful and more importantly it's pleasing to God. It is needful, saints, it is needful. And it is pleasing to God. And that's the very reason right there that we should do it. Because it's pleasing to the Heavenly Father. I want to please my Heavenly Father. I remember back in the days when I would listen to these old saints of God. And it's always the old saints, the women in the church. It was always the women. The older women. They would be at the front of the church bawling their eyes out, crying, wailing in the Spirit, travailing in the Spirit. Yeah. 
And one day I said, there, I go, what is going on with them old women up there? And they said, they're praying for people. Yeah. They're praying for our nation. Yes. They probably prayed for you. Mm -hmm. oh. yes. Somebody had to pray for me. Yes. Somebody prayed for you. Yes. And it may not have been anybody you even knew. What do you mean, preacher? Because when you're an intercessor, God will bring faces. He will bring names. He will bring nations to your mind. As you are beginning to pray, you open yourself up with communication with God and He will begin to pour out in you the people that you need to intercede for. Now think about this. None of you here can leave tonight and not be responsible for what I just said. That's right. Not even me. He has called us to intercede for our nation. For people we don't even know. For people that quite possibly hasn't even been born yet. Let me close. We should seek to cultivate intercessory practice in our lives. What do I mean by that? Instead of getting even, get on your knees. Instead of being vengeful, get on your knees. Instead of complaining, get on your knees. Father, thank you for the Spirit in this house tonight. I thank you for the Spirit in this house tonight. We see the evidences of a nation that is finding her way away from God. And church, we have been called to pray for our nation. To pray for its people that they may know who God is. You say, well, what can I do? Just what I told you. If every one of us would just take the moment to get in front of a thrice holy God and cry out for our nation, for other nations, for people, for people we know, people we don't know, we begin to cry hot tears of repentance, and begin to cry hot tears of intercession, you'll begin to see things turn around. You see, too many times we here in America, we are looking for that trumpet to sound so that we can do as less. As we have to do before we leave. Hmm. We don't preach escapism. Yes, the trumpet's going to sound. But Jesus also said, Occupy till I come. In other words, I want you to be interceding until I come. I want you to be preaching the gospel until I come. I want you to be ministering to the little children until I come. I want you to preach Sunday school to the adults until I come. I want you to educate the people until I come. I want you to pray and intercede. I want you to fast. I want you to pray. Until I come. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this atmosphere. <clears throat> it's a sober atmosphere. Father, as we're thinking tonight about the words that your Spirit just brought forth, I want people to know I do not hate homosexuals. I love them. I love them so much to pray for them. I love them so much, I want to teach them and tell them the truth. 
But I'm seeing a, a, a culture beginning to cultivate and to begin to coddle those things that are not godly, those things that will destroy the soul. I cannot stand back and be silent anymore. Those that think fornication, adultery is okay. It's not. It shouldn't be the norm. All of these things that God says is a no is still a no. And we need to repent of the perversion. We need to repent of the perversion. I'm talking about the church all the way down to the unsaved. We need to repent of the perversion. We need to repent of the godlessness in America today. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found none. Tonight, I hope we have found more than one. We need to find a church that's willing to dedicate their life for others. We are children of God. Our Lord is Jesus Christ. He was our great intercessor and still does so on the right hand of the Father today. If He does it, and He is King of kings and Lord of Lords, why do we not do it? We need to do it. We need to do it. I'm looking around here tonight. And everybody in this house is saved. Well, here's the question. Is there anybody in this house tonight that's backslidden? Away from God? I want to pray for you. And there's something else, church, that we need to stop doing. And I'm not saying that this church doesn't, but I've been in some churches that do. When I give an altar call for backslidden or lost and undone, we've got people that are judging the people as they're coming down the aisle. That's the very reason why people don't come to church. Love them. If you can't do anything else, come down and pray for them. Amen. That's what we're supposed to be doing. I don't care if we dump a whole bottle of oil on them. At least they'll know we love them. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful that God we live in the time and the hour we live in. Father God, you have called us and appointed us to this hour. Lord, to be a light in darkness. To be a trumpet. To be a watchman. To be an intercessor. To be a child of God. In an hour that it's getting more difficult to be just that. Father, give us the strength that we need. Give us the encouragement that we need. Father God, help us, Lord, to grab a hold of the responsibility and the call on our life. And Father God, walk forward because, Lord, we have to understand that even though we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, Lord, you go before us. Let us realize, God, that everywhere you have told us to go, you have been there before us. And you have prepared that place for our arrival. And your Holy Spirit resides in us. And no weapon formed against us shall prosper. God, give us the confidence and the boldness that we need as we move forward. 
And Father God, as the doors open to this church for our prayer meetings, for our services, Father God, let us have an attitude of repentance, one, and intercession, number two. And Father God, let us, Father God, do what you've asked us to do. And that is to support the ministries with the finances you've given us to do it with. Our prayers, our attendance, and the use of the talents, God, that you've given us, and the gifts that work in our lives, that, Lord, we may manifest the fruit of the Spirit, God, in our life. All of these work to benefit the body. All of them work to benefit our community. And not only our community, but our states. If not our state, God, our country. If not our country, Lord, the world. Yes. Father God, we just thank you. We praise you, God, that you're a sovereign God. You're a God of warning. You're a just God, but you're certainly a God of mercy. And Father, as we leave here tonight, let us be reminded of that most merciful thing that you did. We call it Christmas. Father God, it was the day of intercession. You brought forth a Savior into the world. As He grew, as He ministered, He changed the lives of millions. And He's still changing the lives of millions today. Father God, help us be the element. God, help us be that people that You've called us to be to continue that change in people's lives. Father, we thank you for the word. We ask God tonight, Lord, as we go our separate ways, Lord, that you keep us. That you continue to hedge over us. Lord, help us, God, not to violate that hedge. Lord, let there be no gap. Father God, help us to be repentant. Help us to intercede and help us to believe that we can make a difference. In Jesus' name. We pray and all the saints would say, Amen. Amen.